let's bow as we pray for these. Father, when we come together, it's a family reunion. And we've missed being together and we're enjoying this time of fellowship and we have many things we need to, to talk about and pray about, hurt about, hurt about together because we are family. And we pray for these folks that we have mentioned for Dave Williams' family. We're grateful that his suffering and waiting is over that he now beholds your face in all your glory, and we're grateful. We're also grateful, dear Lord, that uh, Rebecca and her family, Becky and her family, have, have had strong faith throughout this and have had peace, and we ask your blessings to continue on them and all of us who've lost a good friend. Father, be with the chestnuts and with Mackie especially that you'd give her peace and give the family, uh, Jackie and David and Tammy, your peace as well. And Father, uh, Father, whatever you can do, please, we ask you to do it for her, whatever would be best. Father, also be with Avalon Tanksley as she's going to be having surgery this week. Be with Rebecca Hedges as she will have tests on her uh, breast. Also with Kathy Millsap, uh, whose doctor is contemplating surgery there. We pray for Rachel Osborne, Sherma Clark. We pray for Kathy Patterson as she continues to recoup from her uh, bike accident. We pray for David Pippen. We pray that his tumors would shrink again, Lord, that you would uh, exercise your power. Hour. Also that you would be with Travis Snyder who is recuperating from surgery and having such a difficult time. We ask that you bless Lisa as she ministers to him and that you would touch Travis's body and heal him. And also that you would be with Ismail's family, uh, Ismail who passed away in Honduras. We pray, Lord, that you will comfort them and show them a path to greater fruitfulness uh, in the future than even was possible in the past. Bless our service of praise to you and our study together in the name of Jesus. Amen. It is good to see everyone tonight. All right. I am thine own. Before our 
After this song, we let in our main prayer tonight, Sweet Power of Prayer. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour. are heavy today, or we're mindful of the Williams family. And Father, at uh, moments like this, I, I, it just seems appropriate to reflect on such a gracious life that we were able to witness um, in Dave. Father, thank you for the example of gentleness and grace and humility that he set for all of us. Uh, in a word, he was Christ-like. And thank you, Father, for the blessing that it has been and that his whole family is to our church family. Father, we pray for an end to this pandemic. We pray for a vaccine. And we pray that um, even though our lives are disrupted at times and we have to go about things differently and we're taken out of our normal routine, Father, we know and help us to always realize what a transcendent God you are. That you can defeat any pandemic, that you're greater than any disease. Father, help us to have more faith in you. Father, Paul's already prayed for so many in our family that are struggling physically and who are ill. Uh, Father, I pray for a cure for cancer. It's affecting so many of, of our own. I pray for those doctors, those nurses, and all those providers that are attending to our family members who are suffering with cancer and, and with so many other ailments. Father, I add to our list Richard and Sandy Stewart. I just pray that you would bring, um, bring function, you would bring healing back to her legs. And then I, pr I pray for Richard that you would heal his back and just help them, Father, to get back on their feet. Father, I pray that you would also be with, with our country, with our society. I pray for an, an end to the racial tension, to the political tension. And Father, help us as children of God to show the world peace 
show them that transcendent love that you have. Father, I pray for all those who are starting school tomorrow. I pray for our teachers, for our administrators, and most of all for our students. Father, protect them. Keep them from COVID. And Father, I just pray that tomorrow's school opening will go smoothly, that the numbers will continue to go down, and that our children's lives can get back to normal, as well as our families' lives. Father, thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Just looking. You have to forgive me. I haven't seen the new. Have y'all noticed this is better? Did y'all know we got a new projector? It's got like four times the. Give me the next slide. I want to see it. Oh boy, that's nice. You can actually tell its color. All right. <laughs> that's great. That is great. Um, appreciate you so much. A couple of things I forgot to mention. I. It's on me. I should have put a sign out there at that door that said we're going to come in the breezeway, but I didn't. We just removed all the signs and moved them over here. So if there was any confusion, if you bumped your nose against the door, it's on me, okay? Please don't sue me. But anyway, <laughs> you come in through the breezeway now. We realize it was a whole lot easier for, for all of us to get in here if we come in through the breezeway, okay? So there's not any big steps, you know. Lawrence and Murtis especially were braving the big steps getting up in here. So we're certainly uh, happy to make that, that possible for them. Also remember... Um, to complete an attendance card, if you would. You can leave it in one of those baskets, those contribution baskets over there, or you can leave it in your seat. It does not matter. Whichever way is convenient for you. Since you're going out that way, it might be handy to just leave it in the basket. So if you have your attendance card and you complete it, we just for visitors, we'd like your name and address and email and a phone number, if you don't mind. And if you're a regular member, your name and your date, the date, the date today, which is the 23rd. So don't, don't feel like you have to fill out all that information. And you're offerings can go in there too or you can give as I told Jerry a moment ago uh, on our website okay but if you didn't get a card let somebody know get a card and fill it out so we'll know that you've been here also again at the end of the service today you'll dismiss by rows so as those of you who are new we start at the front and we go slowly back row by row so please um, honor that as we try to keep from mixing and mingling germs too much, 
okay? So we appreciate that. And also, I don't know how many of you caught this, but it was released just a little bit ago. Um, the, the, the government has said that there is a new and very effective treatment for COVID. It has to do with antibody treatment, plasma antibodies have been proven to be effective in lowering the mortality rate and might be the most effective of all treatments. So this is really, really good news and we can thank uh, our scientists uh, for having done that, uh, for having found that and discovering what of course God already knew but and helping us find it and to treat this disease. So please uh, remember, I also do wanna tell you that hospitalizations in Northwest Arkansas have dropped about 80% since five weeks ago. To give you an idea, you know, you hear a lot of bad news, but that's really good news. Northwest Arkansas hospitals have around 30 patients in them with COVID-19. That's 30. We had 150 not too long ago. So those numbers are going down, and that really is good news. Keep wearing your masks, of course. All right. So we've been in pandemic mode for five months now. I'll tell you, it's been a once-in-a-lifetime circumstance. It's been 100 years since the Spanish flu epidemic. Uh, people got sick and go to the hospital and we can't visit them. Uh, loved ones in nursing homes cannot receive guests for the most part. Some are able, but most are not. People talk through the doors and we've all seen these heart-rending pictures of grandchildren talking to grandparents through the windows of a nursing home facility. And if you think that's bad, the public discourse on how to fix COVID-19 has been even worse. And I just got a feeling that the day after election day, we're probably gonna have found a cure and no more COVID-19. <laughs> I'm kidding, but I'm just saying that's just how toxic things are out here. And it doesn't matter what party you are, if you're independent, it doesn't matter. It's, there's poison out in the air. Don't be, don't be breathing that in so much uh, because it'll get you sick. I'm, I'm persuaded that a lot of reasons that people get sick is, ang well, I know it. It's scientifically proven you can get sick from anxiety. So don't, don't take in too much anxiety producing things. It's nice to be informed, but it's another thing to be engulfed with this kind of bad news. So what should we think about? I mean, what do we do during this time of worry and anxiety? Is there something we can do to alleviate the adversity? Well, the book of Philippians, I think has some of the most relevant wisdom from the Holy Spirit about this very thing. The Apostle Paul wove together some beautiful words in this evening's text about how he dealt with adversity. And I'm going to give you the context. We're going to be in Philippians 1 verse 9 in just a moment and then read through verse 18 together. In verse 1, 7, which we read last week, Paul referred to his imprisonment which means that Paul was in prison, probably in Rome, uh, and he wrote this gloriously joyful and instructive text while incarcerated. Think about that. Uh, many good things happen while in prison for the child of God. And Paul, I'm persuaded Paul would not have written the letters he did if he hadn't been put in prison a few times. Uh, he didn't seem to want to take the time to write until he was kept to himself. So, uh, so we're going to read the text together. Philippians 1, 9 through 18. And remember, as we read this, that Paul was in prison. He was in the midst of adversity when he wrote this. Okay, verse 9. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. I want you to remember that, what he said there. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. 
The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. And when Paul speaks of suffering, he's speaking of his imprisonment, his being in chains, but you'll note that he does not once complain about his chains. He doesn't complain about his circumstance, he merely mentions it. He's teaching by his actions that there are worse things in life than being chained to a Roman soldier, although you and I might have a hard time believing that. Paul is telling us that he has overcome and that we may overcome as well if we trust God as he did and do as he did. So I've, found, I've, I've gotten a few points from, from this, this text that I want to look at. How do we live in adversity? Because Paul's telling us how. Number one, Paul prayed for others. He prayed for others. Well, now wait a minute. If you're in adversity, shouldn't you be praying for yourself? Well, sure, I would expect you to do that. But my first point is the one you don't expect. Be sure that you pray for other people. Because Paul does. He's the one in jail. But you notice he doesn't say, please pray for me. Not in this text, not in this passage. He's praying for others. He prays in verses 9 and 10 that our love would grow, that their love would grow. He's telling us how this happens in verse 9 and 10. My prayer that your love may abound and grow with knowledge and discernment. Wouldn't it be easy for us in similar circumstances to whine and complain about our, the difficulties that we're experiencing? I complained a lot at first about the pandemic. I complained a lot about it. I still do some, and I'm sorry about that. When everybody ran out of toilet paper, I couldn't stop thinking about that inconvenience. When the flour sold out, I grumbled that we might never bake again. And then the worst thing happened. They ran out of Dr. Pepper. <laughs> you can't find canned Dr. Peppers. Have you noticed that? Now you'll go look. We drink canned Dr. Peppers at our house, and we haven't had a canned Dr. Pepper in our house in a month. They say, isn't that awful? Isn't that terrible? Pray for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you get the idea, right? The things that we talk about, the things that I talk about are first world problems. They're first world problems. They're the problems that rich people have, not what poor people have. Or wearing a mask. Oh, that's inconvenient. It is inconvenient. But we do it. But we grumble. Let's talk about Paul's problems for a moment here. He's chained to a soldier. He is confined. Prisons in those days did not serve food. If you ate, it was because friends or family brought you food. Instead of grumbling and complaining about the impossibility of his situation and not knowing where his next meal might come from, Paul prays for other people. He prays for these dear Philippians. He says, I'm praying that your love will increase more and more to each other. Oh, man. And I complain that there's no canned Dr. Pepper in my store. Well, he prayed for their spiritual maturity. He prayed for their faith. Paul prayed for others during his adversity. Now, how do we deal with adversity? Do we pray? Yeah. But we usually pray for rescue, don't we? We pray for strength. We pray for rescue. We pray for help. We pray for deliverance. Well, that's, that's good. That's okay. I'm not saying that's bad. But it wasn't the first thing that Paul did. He prayed for others. In, the Lord prays this this way too. The Lord did this too. You know, as the Lord considered what was about to happen to him, when Jesus knew he was going to be fraudulently tried, beaten half to death, the ridicule, the spitting, the insults, the long agonizing spiking to a cross and gradual suffocation. 
The Lord prayed this in John 12, 27. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I've come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and I'll glorify it again. And the crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered and others said an angel spoke unto him. And Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Do you see what Christ did? He prayed for a rescue in his time of extreme adversity. But note here, he prayed, glorify your name. And he realized, hey, I came to the earth for this time. For this time. He saw the bigger picture. He saw God's glory. God said to him and spoke to him. And Christ said, this is bigger than me. It's bigger than me. This is about the ruler of the world, the prince of the power of the air, being driven out of the earth forcibly by the power of the love of my sacrifice and the blood that I'm going to shed. That the serpent would be driven out, the prince of the power of the air. Now that's what Jesus thought about. And Jesus prayed, and during his prayer for deliverance, he ended up praying a prayer of thanksgiving to God for the opportunity to do what the Lord, his Father, had asked him to do, to make an eternal difference for us. God was going to get glory, and that's really all that mattered. The praying during adversity is normal, it's important, but just remember not to miss the opportunity to pray for the things that are more important than our rescue from adversity. That's not something we're hearing much these days. We're hearing about how we need to steel ourselves and be tough and be faithful and be trusting. I'm saying that a time like this, maybe defense, the best defense is a good offense. We need to be praying for other people. We got a host of people to pray for. That that is power to see the bigger picture of what's happening in the world. Well, so what do we do? The second thing we got to do is see the big picture. Got to see the big picture. Without God's help, we cannot understand the big picture. I've known parents of children, for instance, who have. These kids have rejected the Lord all of their lives, and then when their faithful, godly mother passes, they come to understand something they did not know while their parents were alive, that they needed Jesus and came to faith after they died. Do you have faith like that? Do you believe that? That they saw the bigger picture in the midst of the worst of adversity. We can do the same thing. We can see the same thing. The Holy Spirit is showing us the picture. We just need to stop long enough to take it in, to see what's happening, to see how life and death is lived out before them. You remember Dave Williams' family with what dignity he lived his life, but the way Dave in a dignified, trusting way, lived his whole life before his family and how that will always be remembered and what a witness that is to his family and to anyone that knew him. Now, Paul saw the big picture because there were some pretty awful things happening in Philippi at the time he wrote this. We don't talk about that much about Philippi. It's the most wonderful book, but there's some serious stuff going on in the Philippian church. There's, there's a lot of back and forth that's going on. And, uh, of course, not the least of which is Paul being arrested and put into prison. There's stuff going on. He stated, though, that because he was in prison, he said, you know what? My co-preachers and co-teachers, no matter how they feel about me, are becoming more bold. In fact, he says, some are preaching out of rivalry with me. He says, okay. 
Because Christ is being proclaimed. It doesn't really, even if it's done with pretense, the seed is greater than the sower, so he's not sweating it. He doesn't just agonize, oh, I wish these guys would preach for the right reason. I wish they would teach out of some other reason than selfish ambition. And he says, no, 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 no. Christ is being proclaimed, and that's the main thing. See, he saw the bigger picture. He didn't just curse the brothers and, brothers and sisters who were teaching and preaching out of the wrong motives. He saw the good that was being done in spite of them, that the seed was greater than the sower. And the glory of the proclamation is the key to understanding this passage here. When you see, he said, look, he said, even the imperial guard, that's the praetorian guard, that's the green beret secret service of the Roman army. These are the elite of the elites. And by the way, that's one of the reasons we think he wrote this in Rome is because that's where the Praetorian Guard was mostly headquartered. But they were guardians of the emperor's power as well as the elite troops that would fight difficult battles. And he said, you know what, my imprisonment has caused everybody in the Praetorian Guard, most of the Praetorian Guard knows that I am here because of Christ. He didn't gnash his teeth to say, I've been unfairly put here because I don't have my religious freedom. He did not say that. He said, because I'm here, they know that the only reason I'm here is because I hold to Jesus. And he said, that's a great thing. I want you to note here that, and I want to take a quick tangent for just one second and then get back to the main point. Did you notice that Paul nowhere says that anybody in the imperial guard had actually obeyed the gospel? I said, hmm, well, I, maybe they did. Maybe they did. He doesn't mention it because that's really not the point. The proclamation is the point. It's the telling of the story that is the point. He claimed that they knew that he was there because of Jesus. And that's the glory of it. And when that story was repeatedly told, God got more and more glory. I know we want results when we preach the gospel or support mission work. We want baptismal numbers. We want numbers of churches planted. And that is important. I'm not saying it isn't. But what is of paramount importance to Paul here is, is that people are hearing the news. They're hearing about Jesus. We trust God for the increase, right? We trust God for the increase. We sow the seed. And don't worry so much about the increase. Paul did not concern himself with baptismal numbers here in Rome. He was concerned that people would come to Jesus in some way, some knowledge of him. And that they would act accordingly. Because in Isaiah 55, 11, here's the promise. This is a great promise. You should mark it in your Bible. 55.11 of Isaiah says, this is God speaking. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. But it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. When God's word is taught, when Christ is shared, God will accomplish what he wants accomplished. It doesn't matter that Paul was limited in what he could actually do and the places he could go. He was always speaking of Christ and there was always something to spread about Jesus. Now to the bad stuff going on. It is unthinkable that anybody would want to ever put down the Apostle Paul, the greatest messenger of Christ ever. Yet some were very critical of him. I'm unsure of the reasons. We're given some hints in Philippians chapter 1. There was jealousy and rivalry among preachers and teachers. He said, some preach out of goodwill, others don't. Some preach because they want the gospel spread, others preach because of selfish ambition. For the limelight, for the power, for the influence. Some even thought they could make Paul more miserable by having success while he was in jail. That's just unbelievable. And Paul said, just glad that Christ's name is being spoken of. That's the most important thing. It's unthinkable that anyone would think 
would want to hurt Paul the Apostle, but Paul was pretty much like anybody else, except what an incredible faith he had, what an incredible message he had. And if Christ is preached, whatever the reason, Paul said God's glorified, that's all that really matters. So no matter what ambitious teachers are saying about him, he will rejoice. And that is seeing the big picture. That's the big picture. He didn't seek vindication, although he certainly deserved it. He made no self-defense, although he certainly could have. He simply rejoiced because Christ was first place and people were hearing the message. Truett Foster McKeehan uh, is the son of Toby Mack. Many of us know Toby Mack, uh, not personally, but we know his music. He's been cutting records for quite a while. His son died last year, not even quite a year ago, uh, in Franklin, Tennessee, at his home. And for a while it wasn't known how Truett had died, but Truett, the oldest son of Toby Mack, a noted gospel singer, took his own life with a drug overdose. He was 21 years of age. Toby Mack was asked about that. What's going to happen? What are you going to do? Here's what Toby Mack said. My wife and I would want the world to know this. We don't follow God because we have some sort of under the table deal with him. Like we'll follow you if you bless us. We follow God because we love him. God is the God of the hills and the valleys. Close quote. Sounds like he's singing his message because he loves God, no matter what happens to him. Charles Colson, for those many of us here, we remember the Watergate scandal many years ago, and Charles Colson was the meanest of the mean guys in the White House of Richard Nixon. In the 1970s Watergate scandal, he pled guilty to obstruction of justice. He spent seven months in a federal prison. He was facing arrest. A friend of his gave him a copy of C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. Colson read it and gave his life to Christ. Colson then joined a prayer group at his prison, or before he went into prison, of both Democrats and Republicans, before he was put into prison. And newspapers ridiculed his conversion because they said, Colson's just trying to get out of jail early. He didn't. But oh my, the good things he did while he was there. He learned about how prisons work. He wrote the book Born Again. And through God's power, he employed a de deployed a ministry to prisoners with an emphasis on promoting changes in the justice system while simultaneously working on the hearts of those in prison with the gospel of Jesus. And Prison Fellowship Today, which was his brainchild, is now in 117 countries with 45,000 volunteers who do Bible studies, who do restorative justice. In other words, they, they seek justice for each of these individuals that are in the system and has been seeking prison reform too. And you know what Colson said about his arrest? He said that this happened to advance the gospel. So, decide to live for Christ regardless of your circumstance, regardless of your age, regardless of your situation, your daily circumstances, your finances, your health, whether you think you're shy or you're too busy, Christ will be exalted in your body. Feel free to live for him to the nth degree because Christ has given you so much. We love him because he loved us first, right? And he loved us with a great love. Let's be sure that his story becomes our story. It is our story. Tell others about your hope and then rest in that hope. And tell others and don't worry about how people respond. Again, what Isaiah said, speaking for God, my word will not return to me empty. Stay on that message. Be sure... Be sure to know this, that everything you do in Christ's name will come back and accomplish what God wants it to accomplish. We just need to believe that. We need to believe it. Let's bow together as we close. Father, it's hard to uh, think of taking the offensive during an adverse time, but this really is our time. 
It's our time to reach out to others. It's our time to pray for others. It's our time to truly lean into you, to believe in you, and to act on that faith. And to remember how good you are. Father, we thank you for the good developments that we've heard today about treatments for this disease. And we know this is an adverse time. But we also know that you use adversity so that people will hear about the gospel. We know that's already happened. We pray that the seed will be broadcast far and wide to places we only dream about reaching as we uh, reach the hearts of people for Christ. We ask you to bless us now as we prepare ourselves to take the Lord's Supper. And Father, that we might truly, as a family, gather around this table. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Chris is going to lead us in a song and then we'll have the Lord's Supper together. represents a step towards you. We know that you can heal and this is the way that you heal. We thank you for this bread that represents that brokenness. Represent Christ's body on the cross that gives us this hope. Please help us to take this in a pleasing manner. Amen. God and our Father, we now ask a blessing on this fruit of the vine that represents Christ's shed blood on the cross. We know that the blood of Christ that was shed cleanses whiter than snow. And we are so grateful for that. We ask your blessings as we take this fruit of the vine. Help us to remember. Remember the sacrifice that was given and the excitement that we have of knowing that you're our Father and that we're coming home to you. It's in Christ we pray.
excited to see everyone and I know you were excited to see everyone as well. We hope you have a good evening after we close in prayer. We hope you have a wonderful week. I'm going to ask David if he'll lead us in a closing prayer. Would you bow with me? Father, we are grateful to be together. Uh, to be the church gathered uh, so that together we can sit under your word to hear a voice calling us deeper in to conformity with you a guide that, that shows the way through adversity uh, that can speak hope into our, our own circumstances even now so many years later and Father, I, I pray that as we leave, we can carry that word with us, a word that reminds us to look beyond our own selfish concerns, but to have eyes for others, to lift our voices on their behalf, and to serve them, not thinking of ourselves, but of, but of others first. I pray that we would take from this word a trust that allows us to let go of anxiety. Anxiety even about how your kingdom is received in the world, trusting that your word will not fail. I pray with that burden lifted, the burden of anxiety lifted off our shoulders, we might leave here lighthearted and joyful in the hope that we have in Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Let's go in peace. Thank you.